Hi everyone, my name is Chelsea. Welcome to Little Mountain Ranch. I'm really happy to have you here with me in my kitchen this morning to get a whole bunch of canning done. I am getting started bright and early this morning before I even have gotten dressed. <laughs> and I am going to start getting the meat ready for our canning project today. So we are going to be canning a whole bunch of ground beef. This is around 20 pounds and then around 15 pounds of stew meat over here. So there are a couple of reasons why we're going to cook our meat first. Number one, the color, the texture, and the flavor of fried meat after it's been canned just tastes better in my opinion, but there's actually some safety considerations and this is particularly true when it comes to ground beef. One of the issues with trying to can ground meat without cooking it first is actually a safety issue and that's because that meat is going to form a solid mass in your jar and it is difficult to tell whether the heat of your canner has actually penetrated all the way through evenly through that meat so it's actually a bit of a safety issue. So when it comes to ground meat, um, one of the safety canning um, standards is to make sure that you fry your meat up first. One of the other reasons, and this is sort of just a practical reason, is that when you, if I were to take this and can it raw, in my jar, it would form that solid mass and be a bit of a challenge to get out of the jar afterwards. Also, it does not look very appealing. It kind of just looks like a gray, mushy mass in the jar and you end up having to kind of fry it up anyway just to give it better color and texture. So we're getting ahead of all of those issues by frying all of our meat first. My plan with the stew beef is once we are done cooking all of this ground meat, um, getting it all cooked through and broken apart and start running it through the canner is I'm going to fry up our stew beef using my cast iron fry pans. And the reason for that is because it makes much nicer flavor and color, getting it nice and dark on the outside. And so I'll be frying those in a thin layer so that they don't just kind of steam in the pan and cook through, but so that they actually get some nice color on the outside. Once we get to that point, I'm going to talk with you a little bit about cast iron fry pans. I get a lot of questions whenever I show my cast iron fry pans, how I maintain them, how I keep them well seasoned and things like that. So I'll share that with you as well. But the first thing that we need to do before anything else this morning is turn on our teapot and get a cup of tea brewing because I have not yet had my tea this morning and I'm one of those people that starts the day with a cup of Earl Grey tea every morning. Make that a giant mug of tea. Before we sit down and drink that, I'm going to get our ground beef going. My plan with this ground beef is to cook it up and actually just have it canned with a little bit of salt rather than putting any flavorings or seasonings in it because that way I can use it for whatever I want. Um, I could use it for hamburger soup, I could use it for tacos. I could use it for sloppy joes and just add all of my flavorings and my seasonings when I'm actually going to use the product. All right, now that that is going, it is time to drink some tea. I have a little bit of computer work to do this morning and my house is nice and quiet because everybody's still sleeping so it's a good time for me to get that done. I'm working on creating some content for my membership community for September and I'm going to be talking about all things harvesting, how to know when to harvest certain vegetables and how to be able to store them in the most optimal way. So we're going to get onto that while all this is cooking and I'll be back with you when we move on to cooking all of the um, stew beef up and talking a little bit about cast iron fry pans. So here is our ground beef and I have strained out all the fat from it. Now I am frying up our stew beef over here on our cast iron fry pans. So one of the things about frying stew beef, especially if you're gonna be frying a couple of pounds per pan, is a lot of the liquid comes out and it's hard to get a nice brown on it. So the way that you do that is just let all of this liquid evaporate off. You don't have to worry about your meat getting tough with longer cooking because with stew beef, it actually becomes more tender the longer that you cook it. So once all these juices have steamed away, 
I will fry these up so they get a nice brown on them like this because that just makes number one the flavor better but it also makes the gravy that you can make with the water that you add to this when you're going to can it have a lot more flavor. So you can see here I'm using my cast iron fry pans and most of my cast iron ware hangs on the wall over here by Martha, my wood cook stove. And the way that I maintain my pans is honestly not super complicated. So when I first get my fry pans, most of mine are secondhand. I'll give them a really good scrub and then I will coat them with oil, bake them in the oven at 500 for about an hour. And then I usually do that a couple of times to create a nice seasoned coating on it. And that's what makes your cast iron nonstick. When you wash them, just use water. Don't use soap because the soap will remove that seasoned coating on your pan and dry them right away. Don't leave them to drip dry or anything like that. Dry them right away and then give them a little bit of a coating of olive oil with paper towel and then they're good to go when you use them next time. Sometimes if things are really stuck on the pan, I will have them sit for 10 minutes with some hot water in them. And if they're really, really bad, I will give them a really good scrub with hot water, sometimes a little bit of soap, and then I'll just re-season them again if I manage to get some of that seasoned coating off. One of the other things that I found works really well for using the cast iron is to make sure that they're really hot before you put whatever food it is that you're cooking on them. It just helps to have the food not stick to the pan. That's just something that I found does tend to help a little bit. And as you can see, I am using cast iron on a glass top stove. Obviously cast iron is heavy, so you just need to be careful. I've been using them on a glass top, top stove for a really long time. I've never had an issue with it. Obviously if you dropped something like this on your stove, it's probably gonna break it. Okay, so we have this meat is nice and brown. So that one's done. We're gonna push that off the stove. This one is just about there for both of the things that we're making today, the ground beef and the stew beef. It's 90 minutes of processing time, plus the time it takes to bring the temperature up and cool the canner down afterwards. So it's a very long process and being a, and doing large batches like this, it can take forever with just one canner. So I've been on the hunt for a second canner and Dan actually found an all-American canner in town. We have a very small town and I have never seen an all-American canner in one of the stores in our town and he bought it for me yesterday. I haven't even seen it yet. He came home later last night. I haven't even opened the box yet. So I'm really excited about that. That is going to speed up my uh, canning times by a ton and I cannot wait. I'm just going to get these dishes washed here and get my jars washed. I'm gonna be able to do 14 jars, so that's exciting. And I'll be back with you to open up the new canner and get everything running through and talk with you a little bit about pressure canning meat. My pans are all clean. See how nice and shiny they are? So I just put that little smear of olive oil I was talking about. I'm gonna hang them back on the wall scrub my stove down and then we are going to unpack my new canner. So the reason that I wanted an all-American canner is because I'm familiar with one. I have my old all-American over here that I actually got second hand for like a hundred dollars or something like that a long long time ago and I know how it works and I'm comfortable with it. The other thing is the all-American doesn't require any kind of seal or anything like that. I'll share that with you when we go open up the new one. I have all of my jars washed up over here. My kettle going here because we're going to fill these jars up with boiling water and a little bit of salt once we get our meat in there. That's so exciting. Okay, it's in the house. Let's open it up. I think it's possible that this one is actually bigger than that one. I always thought that was a 921, but this one looks taller. So let's open it up and see. Well, I have been contemplating buying another canner for the last long while. I didn't expect to get one yesterday. So this feels a little like Christmas. It looks so pretty. So this one is a little bit bigger than that one. So this one I can actually stack two pints or two layers of pints high. It comes with two racks. So you need to put a little bit of olive oil on the edge of your canner and the beveled edge here. You see how it can come, it goes down a little bit. So this just acts 
as a lubricant for your lid. Make sure it slides on nicely and slides off nicely. I always put a little bit along the edge of this as well. So you just need enough to just make it shiny. Um, and they do say in the manual here not to use any other kind of oil. You can use this like olive oil or uh, petroleum jelly like Vaseline. This is exciting. So let's get our jars filled up and get both of these canners going because we have a lot of canning to do today. So this should do eight quarts if I calculated this correctly. So there was around 14, 15 pounds of meat here. So we're gonna top off these with nice hot water. So we're gonna do exactly the same thing with our ground beef as we did with our stew. You could totally add seasoning to this if you wanted to make it chili flavored or whatever kind of flavor you want. But like I said, I just wanna have options for whatever recipe I want. So I'll just flavor it as I need it. Um, the consistency of this, I would say with the ground beef is a little bit more tough. The opposite with the stew beef, it tends to be super tender but I do find that the ground beef gets a little bit more of kind of a tough texture. So we're leaving around an inch of headspace on both of these. So all American canners have an arrow and then there is an arrow on this too and that's what you wanna line up. You wanna make sure these are nice and snug all the way around. If you do lots of pints when you're pressure canning, then I would definitely recommend this one because you can fit two layers in it. But if you don't and you just do quarts and you can't afford one of the big giant ones where you can do um, two quarts high, then I would suggest this one. So this one is a 915 and this one is a 921, but this littler one, my older one, fits seven quarts as well. So now what we're gonna do is bring our canners up to the point where there's steam coming out of the vent pipe right here and right here. Once the steam's coming out of there, we're gonna set our timer for 10 minutes, let it vent for 10 minutes, and then we'll put our weight on. We have the steam coming out of this vent pipe. And so now we're setting our timer for 10 minutes. And once that timer has gone off, we'll set it for, we'll put the weight on, I'll show you that, and then we'll set it for 90 minutes. 90, sorry, not nine, 90 minutes. Of all of the things that you have to do with pressure canning, this is the part that is probably the scariest for most people. So we're gonna be doing 15 pounds of pressure. So we're gonna use the hole with the 15 pounds mark. I come in at it from the side and put it on like so. So now what we're going to do is wait until our pressure comes up to 15 pounds on the gauge here. This is going to start wobbling a little bit and when that happens, we're going to turn our heat down. Medium low works the best for me, for my stove, for keeping it at the right pressure, but you'll have to experiment with your stove to see. You want this to move about four or five times per minute. If it's moving a lot more than that, then you need to turn your temperature down. If your pounds of pressure dips down at any point during the canning time below the pounds of pressure that you need for your elevation, you actually need to restart your canner at that point. Okay, this is what we're looking for. Can you see how it's wobbling and you can hear that? So I'm gonna turn this down. 
and we're still waiting for this one. So interestingly, this tanner is taking longer to come up to pressure and it took longer to steam than this one over here. I honestly have no idea how old <laughs> this pressure tanner is. We have replaced all of the important safety components on this one, which I would recommend doing if you buy a secondhand tanner. But yeah, this bigger one came up to pressure faster. Okay. I'm gonna set my timer for 90 minutes. I just turned the timer off and they're just coming down. You wanna wait before you try to open this or anything until your gauge is at zero. So we're gonna go outside while this is cooling and take a quick peek at the garden because we had rain yesterday all day long and all night long. The rain did two things. It obviously watered everything, which is fantastic, but it also helped to clear out a lot of the smoke and now it's clearing. The temperature is now going to shift from very cool, like it's been this last week, to super hot, at least hot for us this time of year. We're gonna head into the high 20s and I'm kind of excited about it because I wouldn't mind a couple more lake days before the summer's over. I just wanted to show you what Dan's working on right now. This is a really, really old mower. It's almost 100 years old. This <laughs> comes with the coolest story. So Dan was just telling me that this has a wooden, what is this called? A uh, Pittman arm, Dan thinks it's called, and it was wooden, totally rotten. So Dan went down to our shed and look what he found. This is actually- <laughs> It still had the parts tag on it. A like parts tag from the former owners that used to live here. And that's so crazy. For, so it was for actually for this old mower. What are the chances of that? One in a zillion. One in a zillion. <laughs> That's incredible. So the guy that we bought this property from kept everything like lots of old farmers used to do. We even have equipment from when they used to use horse, um, horses and wagons and horse drawn haying equipment and stuff on this property. So Dan and I are the third owners in the last hundred years of this property. And the two owners before us kept everything like lots of old farmers did back in the day and it's a very smart thing to do but we are so grateful for it because there has been so many times over the last eight years when we have needed a part or a bolt or a screw or something and it has been here the chances of finding a part for a hundred year old piece of machinery that still had the part tag on it are so slim like how cool is that Oh my gosh, my garden just looks incredible with all this rain. Look at how big everything looks. We have to take our customary wander over and look at our beautiful little flower patch. I was away for a lot of the month of June. Oh look, there's one of my honeybees. Um, for the month of June, for most of the month of June. And one of my daughters planted this bed of flowers. And I just love the way it looks. So cheerful. And my bees love it too. <laughs> Look at this giant green acre cabbage. That is massive. Oh my goodness. These are beautiful cabbages. I could probably harvest that, but I kind of want to see how big it can grow. Look at how beautiful our Brussels sprouts are looking. You'll notice that I've cut off the top of my Brussels sprout plants here. And one of my friends who just completed a master gardener's course said that if you cut off the top of your Brussels like this, when it's this time of year, they'll stop putting all that energy into producing more plant on the top and develop the sprouts on the bottom. So we'll see if it works. So far, so good. I am excited to see that we have some beautiful pumpkins. Look at that beauty. That's a Cinderella pumpkin. And then when I was looking over here, I saw this beautiful pumpkin. Is that not gorgeous? How beautiful. Lots of these beauties in here. So as much as this gardening year has been a challenge, there has been some things that have just done so well. And of all the gardens that I've ever had, I feel like this one's the most beautiful. <laughs> it makes me so happy when I come down here. Almost every single one of my sunflowers this year are growing multiple heads on them. And I didn't have that with these ones. These are teddy bear um, 
sunflowers and they obviously hybridized with one of the other varieties that I had last year and we ended up with these beautiful plants. Look at that beautiful one over there. I'm kind of hoping that it stays warm enough for all of these, look at all of the potential flowers on this one sunflower plant because it would just look so beautiful if every single one of them was blooming on here. And our big giant sunflower over here finally bloomed up there. It is well over 10 feet tall. Same with this one though. Won't it look beautiful if we have enough time for all of these flower heads to grow? And if you look in here, we even have more coming out of the bottom parts of these flowers. Here's hoping the summer goes on for a long time into September because that would be just magnificent, all filled with yellow blooms. This one up here is so cheerful and beautiful. I would really like to collect seeds from these, um, all of them, because they're all beautiful, uh, and plant some next year. But the blackbirds love them, as you can see. They have already eaten a ton of the seed off of this one. So we'll see if I can beat the blackbirds. What else did I want to check out? Oh, right. I wanted to look and see if we have any pickling cucumbers that we need to harvest because I just have not had very many. But again, same thing. As long as there's flowers on these plants, which there is, maybe this heat wave will give us another flush. I have not made very many pickles this year, actually. Dan and I are going to be taking a trip tomorrow to the fruit stand that I was talking to you about where we've got our peaches and our tomatoes and we are going to buy a whole bunch of tomatoes and I might end up buying some pickling cucumbers. So why, you might be asking, would I be buying tomatoes when I have my high tunnel filled with tomatoes um, right now? The reason for that is because we go through a lot of tomato products and with this year being a little bit sketchy as far as the weather goes, we may end up with a good harvest and we may not. We may end up with a random freeze that comes and kills off all of our tomato plants. So, actually open the doors up here. It's nice and warm today. Oh my gosh, isn't that not the cutest little sunflower? Look at that pretty one up there. So lots of beautiful tomatoes here. And I'm probably gonna end up with a decent enough harvest, but the reality is that I usually can hundreds and hundreds of pounds of tomatoes every year, and I'm really not sure what I'm gonna get, end up getting out of here. So since this particular place that we're going has their tomatoes on sale right now, and for a really great price, I am just gonna go buy a whole bunch, probably gonna buy 500 pounds or so, and get all those canned up. And anything that we ended up getting out of here is going to be an added bonus. And I'll just make more product. We will use as many jars of tomatoes as I can can. So even with us buying, we're probably gonna buy around 500 pounds of tomatoes. Um, even with us buying those and processing all those, I will easily be able to can up all the tomatoes we're gonna grow in this. And maybe I'll try to weigh them this year and see how many pounds we get out of there um, and convert all those into tomato products too. And we will easily use all of that over a year. Normally when I make a recipe, I use three to four quarts of tomatoes per recipe. So there is no risk of having anything go to waste. We will definitely use it up. So that major rain that we had came in here and knocked over a bunch of my onions, which is okay. I honestly can't remember what this variety of onion was, but it was a fancier, smaller um, onion. So we'll give these a couple of days to dry out a little bit, and then we'll get these ones harvested up. These guys over here, the Red Wings, are still going strong, looking beautiful. Look at those onions down there. So we have our experiment over here. The ones on this side have not been trimmed and the ones on this side have been trimmed. So here is a side-by-side -side example of, this one is a trimmed one, this one is a non-trimmed one. 
and they are pretty much the same size. This one might be a little bit bigger, but then this one over on this side that is not trimmed is substantially bigger than the trimmed one. So we're gonna have to wait until we do our big harvest, probably two or three weeks from now on the onions before we can say for sure which is better to trim your onions back or to not trim them back. But I think it's probably gonna turn out that it really doesn't make that big of a difference. I'm sure that my canner has cooled down enough now and I've had a little bit of sunshine. We haven't seen any sun for days with all the smoke and the rain, but I do need to get those next batches into the canner. I forgot to tell you the purpose behind Dan having this old mower and what he's doing. Let me quickly show you down here before we head up to the house. Over this away, can you see behind the high tunnel there, that big section where there's all that um, willow and bush and stuff like that? There's a whole big area over there. It's probably 20 acres that we want to clear for hay. And right now, because our hay was so bad this year, uh, like I shared, we got 50% less hay than we normally do. There's a whole bunch of area that we could actually hay if we could go in and cut down all those bushes. So that's what we're gonna do, is take the chainsaw in there, manually remove a whole bunch of those bushes. And then we didn't wanna put our good mower in there because likely it's going to hit some stumps and lumps and bumps and all that kind of stuff because the ground is not smooth. Um, so Dan bought that old, or got it for free actually, that old mower. It's a sickle bar mower and he's gonna go try to cut the hay that's in there. So I'll let you know in the next video how that goes. It would be amazing if we could get even 10 more bales. It would be so good. Okay, we're zeroed out. So when you take this off, it's gonna be hot. So do use a towel and it will steam a little bit. So we're gonna let these cool off just a little bit before we actually take them out of the canner because we don't want them to siphon. Siphon is when you take it out and the water kind of boils out at the side of it or the juice or liquid or whatever that you have in your jar and that's caused by the rapid change in temperature so if you let them cool off for about five minutes once you take the lid off the canner that usually mitigates that issue oh oh darn it we lost a jar so when uh, this can canner was starting to come up to temperature I heard like a ting sound from inside and I kind of suspected that might have happened so this is our last batch or two batches last batch is in so I'm just gonna do yet another tidy. What do I have in here anyway? What did I pick? Did I pick something? Ah, my sunglasses, which I had left out in the garden. The four green beans that I grabbed when we were out there, and my phone. Good morning, friends. So. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> he did that on purpose. No, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> he did. You're not coming to catch him. We ended up going to town yesterday afternoon, but I wanted to show you before I ended this video what I ended up with yesterday. We have 25 quarts. So this is what the ground beef looks like um, after we're done canning it. And this is what the stew beef looks like. So the plan now is to remove all the rings. So the rings purpose is just to hold the lid down during the processing. And then I am going to wash these with hot soapy water. This is particularly important when it comes to canning any meat products because you will get a little bit of seepage out the side during the processing. And then you'll get some fat and grease and grossness on the outside of your jar. So I'll wash these with hot soapy water and then put them down in the pantry. All right, friends, that is it for today's video. I 
hope that you enjoyed it. We are going to get going now. Well, I have to go get ready first, but then we are going to go to the fruit stand that I was talking about yesterday and buy a ton of produce. I am so excited to start filling the rest of the shelves. I have a bit of empty space left in my pantry and this should fill us right up and I can't wait. I will be sharing all of that with you, of course, next week, and I look forward to seeing you then. Bye everyone.